Good evening. This meeting is of the uh, Arlington Civilian Police Advisory Body, uh, Board Study Committee it is being convened by remote participation consistent with uh, the state's allowance to conduct meetings remotely in lieu of the COVID-19 pandemic. This meeting is being recorded. Folks should be aware that uh, although members are visible by video, um, that there may be some folks who are observing the meeting by phone or other means, uh, and they don't have to identify themselves by name. Folks are encouraged to please use their full name to help us develop a full record and recognize anybody that's gonna be able to speak rather than use a nickname or a screen name. All votes will be conducted by roll call because the meeting is being conducted remotely. And um, with that, uh, I'll just acknowledge each member that's, or I'll, I'll go around and ask each member to affirm that they're here. So I'm just gonna go down the line as best I can, uh, trying to remember who all the members are. So Susan Ryan Volma. Here. Kathleen Rogers. Here. Here. Carlos Morales. Here. Elliot Elkin. Here. Ann Brown. Here. Michael Brownstein. Here. Chief Julie Flaherty. Here. Bob Radosha. Here. I think I've got everybody who's a member of the committee. I see a, oh, I'm sorry, and Laura Gittleston. I'm Gittleston. here. I think I've uh, touched on everybody. There's a, I see Rebecca Gruber's in attendance. Uh, select board member Leonard Diggins is in attendance and someone identified as Mary, but I don't think I'm missing any members and I'm Doug Heim, town council, uh, also a, a member of the committee. So uh, with that, um, I'll turn it to the chairs to begin the meeting. Um, and um, I'm sorry, <laughs> mine's a little bit uh, muddled today. Um, if um, there's anything else that, uh, that I missed with respect to remote participation, please uh, folks just let me know. Thanks. Thank you all for being here. Um, I know that it's summer and uh, we're trying to get as many meetings in as possible. So I really, we really appreciate the everybody who was able to respond to Sanjay's poll. Um, Sanjay, I, the first thing I had on the agenda was approving prior minutes. Do we have, which I yes, can't we, which. yes, we do from the June 22nd. So if you okay. um, can enable sharing for me, I sure. will, I will share those and we can see if anybody had I circulated those before the meeting. And so if people have corrections or things that I missed, um, now is the time to please let me know. Um, if anybody has corrections while we're waiting to bring it up. And you should be able to share now. Yes, I can, thank you. Now I just have to share the right one. People able to see? people able to see them? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, we can just confirm the attendance is I think the one of the main things. And then um, I'll just slowly scroll through here. Did anybody have any corrections if they happen to read through them beforehand? Okay. Great. Um, I move we approve the minutes I created. <laughs> <laughs> Second. Um, I guess I can take a roll call vote. Uh, all in favor say aye. I'll call everybody by name. Susan. Yes. Carlos. Aye. Sanjay. Aye, yes. Kathy. Yes. Elliot. Yes. Uh, Michael. Aye. Bob. Yes. Uh, did I, Anne? Yes, aye. Thank you. I think, I don't think, I think I got all the voting members here. So the minutes are approved. Thank you, Sanjay. And then did you, I saw an email between you and Ashley. We're going to, these are going to start getting uploaded. These will start getting uploaded. Yes. She and I had, um, well, I was away from email for a few days and then she was on vacation, but we're a little behind, but um, it's on me to 
follow up with her. And, and we're um, gonna, are we gonna be able to use the same space to upload various, pres like the presentations and documents and Exactly, stuff? yeah, we've just been talking about the right way to have them formatted so it makes sense to folks. Okay. Um, and so hopefully fairly soon we should have that, you know, all the previous presentations and um, stuff like that uploaded there. That's great. Yep. Um, I apologize, it's taken me a little bit of time to follow up on that, but. Um, great. So the next thing on the agenda is uh, just to go around and give everyone an opportunity to update the rest of us on uh, anything from the committee or your constituency that you represent, uh, any discussions you've had since our last meeting or not. Doesn't If you don't have anything to say, that is fine, but we thought it would be good to make that a regular part of our meetings. So I'm going to start with Susan. Rainbow Commission. No updates from the Rainbow Commission. Okay. Uh, Carlos. Yeah, no update. Okay. Um, Kathy. No update from Human Rights. Elliot. Uh, I haven't talked to anybody from the school. Since. Okay, I figured probably not. But <laughs> Michael. No update from Envision Arlington. Okay, Bob. Nothing here. Anne. No updates from the Council on Aging. Okay, great. That was fast. Um, and uh, Sanjay and I are town meeting, so we have no updates. Uh, or I assume you have none. Uh, so the next thing on the agenda is uh, a presentation. Uh, Sanjay is going to talk about, we had talked about different models of civilian review that are you, you used in different jurisdictions? And one of the ones that uh, people most quickly uh, sort of identify is the investigative model. And Sanjay has prepared some information for us. So I yes, will give you one second to share that thing now. Um, okay, are folks able to see now? Yes, okay, great. Yeah. Um, so, as Laura said, right, we are continuing our, our series of, you know, of reviewing the, the various models. Um, and so I'll, you know, some credit here, the first few slides, um, once we get started here, are actually from, I think, Doug and Clarissa at a, at a previous meeting. Um, and it's just a review of the sort of four kind of um, models that we've talked about before and some, some basic um, principles. Um, so I thought it'd be good, you know, we haven't met in a month and, you know, just for members of the public as well to sort of go through those things again quickly. Um, and then we'll, and then we'll move on. I have um, a information about the investigative model and then a sort of a case study um, from one um, municipality that uses it. Um, so just a, a reminder, right? And, and I think the, the bold text here, this is again from, from Doug and Clarissa last time around. Um, and the oversight agency's mission should bear some relationship to the size of the police department, the department's funding levels, the level of trust or mistrust within the community, particularly among those segments of the community that historically have been the subjects of over-policing or bias-based policing. Um, and that's a, this is a, from a statement from um, the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement. Um, and so I thought I'd, I'd flash that back up there again to remind ourselves um, what, what spirit we're looking at this, these models in. Um, and I'll remind folks again, right, we have the four, four-ish, right, and, and, right, these are very sort of fluid, and different municipalities have used these in, in different ways, um, but, but, you know, broadly speaking, there are these four-ish models of civilian review. Um, the investigative quality assurance model, which I won't talk about anymore because we're going to talk about that in depth tonight, right, the appeal model, um, where complainants or police personnel um, can appeal findings from internal police department um, processes to um, a review board um, who then review and recommend their own findings to the chief law enforcement officer or other municipal executives um, as appropriate. Um, so in the appeal model, things are specifically focused on individual complaints, um, but they're run after an internal review process has and a disciplinary decision has been made. Um, and then you know, that then at that point, if somebody wishes to, it's brought to um, the appeal board. Um, and 
Doug and Clarissa had collected several examples of places that operate in that manner. Um, the review model, um, so an internal police unit um, does investigations of allegations, develops and findings. Um, citizens review and recommend that the chief law enforcement officer or the municipal executives approve or reject the findings. Um, and so this sort of happens, again, the, the civilian body is not doing any sort of investigation, right? They meet in between the investigation and the recommendation of findings and, and weigh in upon those findings before they're made. Um, is, is where this is happening. Um, and again, examples of that, including our neighbors next door in Cambridge. Um, and then lastly, we have the auditor evaluative performance model. Um, so an auditor or monitor investigates the processes by which the internal investigations um, examine um, complaints, reports of the thoroughness and fairness of the process, um, and they make policy recommendations, right? So this kind of board is very broad um, in their scope, right? They, they can look at all sorts of um, different aspects of policing and investigations, right? Um, these are, could be uh, along with, but, but are often after police investigations. Um, and then again, you know, um, examples that, that Doug and Clarissa had, had pulled through. So hopefully that's a, a a nice quick reminder for folks um, of, of where we've been, right? And, and what we've talked about. Um, any thoughts before we move on? Okay. So what is in the investigative model? Um, the investigative model involves some or all of the below characteristics. And again, remember, right? Every municipality sets up their, their board or commission or whatever differently. Um, and so, you know, no one, no board is going to have all of these things, um, but this is the, the broad strokes, right? Receive complaints, right? Review and classify complaints. And then, um, you know, in a lot of cases, this kind of board is, is led by a community board. Um, and, and those are usually in most municipalities, these are volunteer positions, maybe, maybe some sort of stipend um, in, in some cases for some of the more major ones. Um, but, but largely volunteer. Um, they may allow or disallow appointment of current or former police officers to that volunteer board. Um, that, that definitely varies by, um, by municipality. Um, these kind of model uh, almost always employs trained professional civilian staff, right? These are the people who conduct the investigations, who, you know, um, pull all the data from, you know, from police reports and that sort of thing. Um, in a lot of models, this um, trained staff, right, is the person who classifies the complaints as they come in, decides which ones actually need to be seen by the, by the board, um, and, you know, makes those sorts of determinations. Um, and so, the, you know, that person has to have the right kind of training, right, and, and the right kind of skills. Um, or that person or persons, right, again, depending on the size of department we're talking about. Um, so and then, you know, an investigation is performed. Um, and this is another area of wide variation, right? Many places that investigation happens in parallel to an internal affairs or professional standards, you know, various names for the internal police department investigation, right? Um, many of these boards run in parallel to that. So it's a separate person, you know, talking to witnesses, looking at documents, right? And performing their investigation and asking their questions and however they want to ask them. Um, and then, um, but some places completely replace their internal affairs and, and professional standards department uh, or um, uh, department's not the right word, but um, uh, th they completely replace those with um, this investigative, civilian investigative authority. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't have enough to tell you which is more prevalent. Um, I don't, I don't recall, um, but I, I believe that the parallel is the more, um, more prevalent. But I can't say that for sure. Um, many of these boards have the ability to subpoena witnesses or documents, um, either during the investigative process or later, you know, during a, a hearing or you know, um, 
at, at a later point in the process. Uh, many of them hold a hearing, um, and then and those hearings may be a, a mix of of public um, or executive session. Um, so you know, so so non-public, um, and then they make findings um, on investigations and they recommend discipline. And um, important to remember, right? Those findings and those discipline recommendations uh, may or may not be binding. Um, and in fact, most places, um, as far as I've seen, they are not binding, right? They are they are recommendations that are made to the chief law enforcement officer or to the municipal, you know, somebody mayor or, you know, depending on, on the municipal structure, right? Um, these are recommendations that go to that person. Um, s many municipalities that I've read about require whoever the recommendation goes to, if they don't follow the recommendation, they have to submit a written report back about why they didn't follow the recommendation. Um, so that is one sort of bit of transparency that, that is often there um, in, in this model. Um, but yeah, but they are often, you know, they are most often not binding. Okay. Um, so what is not in the investigative model? Investigative bodies are not typically involved in collecting, observing, or examining trends in police data, right? They are very specifically focused on complaints that are brought to them. So, you know, if, if, if nobody complains about it, right? They they are generally not looking at it. Um, they're not, you know, generally involved in reviewing overall police department policy. They're not reviewing, um, you know, training. Um, they're not looking They're not usually looking at the um, quality or effectiveness or thoroughness of um, professional standards or IA um, uh, investigations, right? They they're going to have their own investigation, right? They're not necessarily offering comment on the quality of the police department internal investigation. Um, and they are often not involved in hearing appeals, right? Because they've heard already, right? And, and made their recommendation. Um, they vary widely in the following parts. Um, their access to investigations completed by internal affairs or ongoing by internal affairs professional standards, some have access to that, some do not. Some, you know, both um, organizations operate completely independently, right? And then, you know, come together um, at the end after the recommendations have been completed. Um, their ability to mandate versus recommend discipline, I already talked about that, right, a, a fair amount. Um, and so I don't think I need to talk about that anymore. And then um, how much they report publicly about complaints, um, investigations, and findings is all all over the place, right? Um, some municipalities, you know, at the end of the year, they report out a number of complaints received, a number of hearings held, and a number of decisions made, right? Um, some of them report, you know, much more detail about. Um, about specific complaints, you know, they they might provide uh, a breakdown of what kinds of complaints they receive. Um, some of them, and we'll, we'll talk about this in one of the in the example that I have put together. Um, but like, um, they may offer a summary of all of the the complaints that they sustained in the course of the year. Um, so there's a wide variety. You know, one of the things we sort of think about, right, when we're t talking about a uh, um, civilian oversight, right, is is transparency and public access to information, right? And so that varies widely in the um, investigative model, and and for good reason, right? There's a lot of reasons that, you know, not to disclose information in a non-sustained finding, right? A lot of um, rules and laws around just, um, you know disclosing personnel records or records, things like that, right? So um, a lot to think about in that respect. Um, okay, I've talked a whole lot here. Sh shall I take a pause and see, let's go around and see if there's any questions. And I can't see everybody's face, so you may have to actually speak up and not just wave. Let me see if I can see more of you. 
any questions or thoughts on what we, hi, yes, Kathy. I was wondering, um, given the, the personnel involved, do you think of this as, you, as we look at the four models, do you think of this one as, the, as an expensive model, the, you know, the most expensive model? Not that I think we need to be hung up on money, although I think we may, that is certainly, I would think a consideration. So I was just wondering if, if given the research that you've, you've done, um, you had a comment on that, Sanjay. Yes, it, it is, you know, everything I've read, this is definitely the most expensive model, right? Um, and the reason for that is professional staff, right? You, you can't right. expect quality investigations, um, right? From if you're, if you're not paying professional staff um, to, to go about doing them. Right, and that, that, that's just the reality. Thank you um, for confirming that. Yep, no problem. Yeah, and, and I totally agree with what you said about like, you know, we should know and acknowledge that, but it doesn't have to be, yeah. Um, anyone else? Okay, um, so let's move a little along here. Um, so this is, comes from some of, um, Nicole has what published and um, some other reading and, and stuff that I've, I've done. Um, so as sort of what are seen as sort of the strengths of, of you know, going with an investigative model. Um, so may, re may reduce bias or reduce the appearance uh, or the perception of bias um, in investigations. Um, civilian investigators often have very specialized training. Again, right, that's part where part of the cost comes in. Um, but you know, you you have paid for specialized training in, in doing that, um, and it may increase community trust in investigations, right? That that's that's really what this model is attempting to do, right? Um, the potential weaknesses, um, the you may lose public confidence if timelines are not met, right? If if the number of um, complaints coming in and the number of you know are not being investigated in time, right? You may lose public confidence. Um, and we've that's been seen in numerous boards um, around the country. Um, but the public may lose confidence if recommendations are not routinely adopted, right? So if if the if the board is, you know, pr producing these investigations and making recommendations, and then those recommendations are not routinely not followed without sound reasoning or without um, publicly acceptable reasoning, right? Um, then that can lead to, you know, loss of legitimacy for the board itself. Um, it may be difficult to maintain readiness and credibility when there are a few complaints. Um, and this is one that, I, you know, I think honestly, we have to think a little bit about, right? For, for ourselves, because we are a small municipality, right? Um, you know, this is, uh, that board right may go a, a significant amount of time between serious complaints, right? You know they they may receive some regular run of the mill stuff, um, but to deal with a serious complaint, right? They have to have the institutional knowledge, right? And they has to have the um, uh, credibility to be able to look at that. And, and that's one area where for a small a municipality, this can be this model can be a challenge, just because it's a long it can be a long time between those serious um, those serious situations. Um, as right, Kathy and I talked a little bit about this is definitely the most expensive model, um, and um, I, you know this isn't my judgment, right? But um, it may face resistance from police personnel. Um, it's come from reading, um, so. Thoughts or questions on on that? Um, I, have a, I have a question. Oh, okay, we got a few. Yep, sure. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, um, I when you were reading about um, sort of, I'm really struck by, and it's something I've been thinking about for a while. The the volume issue, like we know yeah. from what Chief Flaherty reported to us at our second meeting that the number of complaints being received now is very small. You know, even if you, you know, had some reason to guess that there would, you know, they would double if it was a, a civilian, it seems like we're still dealing with a very small number. And what I wondered is, 
if that is data that you saw in the reports, like what what for, number that, of like a like a a well functioning investigative review board, like what kind of caseload? I mean, obviously, I mean, I obviously yep. we're not in New York City, but like yeah. does anybody smaller who's doing it? So I have some numbers from the the specific example that I have. I can't quote like an average or okay. or anything like that. There are some places, and I, I can I'd be willing to do this right. Who um, have calculated sort of like complaints per officer, you know, across okay. lots of different um, lots of different departments, and we could certainly look at at data like that to see where we fit in, okay, um, or or things like that. Um, um, but but I'll, I'll I'll walk us through the numbers um, sure. for my example case. Yep, I think Bob and Susan also had something. Okay. My question is, uh, what's an example of a minor complaint? Um, uh, minor complaint of now I, I looked through all those reports. Um, a minor a minor complaint. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Doug. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. No, no. Go Go ahead. So, uh, for example, and again, I know we don't want to talk about New York City as a perfect lens of this, but uh, you could have a category of complaint called discourtesy, which is basically not not to say that this is not a big deal when uh, uh, professionalism is an important uh, piece of policing, but you might have a complaint that's basically about an officer, you know, being rude or unresponsive or not, uh, you know, maintaining a sort of era or a professionalism. Um, there might be, you know, something about being given a ticket in a way that, you know, somebody didn't think was appropriate or something like that. Whereas a false arrest, excessive force would be your more serious complaints, um, you know, up and until, you know, obviously the most, you know, dramatic types of things. I also, Sanjay, if, if, if the chief might have other ideas about what the spectrum of complaints is from professional standards right now. Uh, Doug, you took the words out of my mouth. We would look at a, at a, a minor complaint as um, some type of um, um, incident on a traffic stop where somebody, a motorist didn't feel that they deserved a ticket. Um, I think that there were several examples of minor complaints. So what, what you all might consider a minor complaint and uh, discourtesy would fall into that category. Thank you both. Does that answer the question, Bob? Yes, that's fine. Thank yep. you. Susan, did you have you had something too, I think. I, I had a question, but maybe it is best for the end, but I'll mention it now. Do you have any examples anywhere where this model has been successful? And by successful, I mean the community has felt good about it. It works with police. That's a good question. I I don't um I think this is a very evolving, I think that's an evolving answer, right? Like, I, I think, and I think that's the truth about all sort of, you know, systems, systems everywhere, right? Uh, of that something that works in a time and place, right, may eventually over time no longer work, um, or, you know, may work for a time and then need or require updates or, or move on to, to something different. Um, I think we can, I think, I don't have a, a, a straight answer for you um, uh, of some place that's like a, a great example of this working, um, but I, I can certainly take the initiative to go and let's see if we can find an example of some place that this is. Yep. Thanks. Anything else before we move on to my case study here? I think that's what I have next. Yes. Okay. So. Um, NACOL has a database of uh, municipalities that use civilian oversight. Um, and so I, I went through their database and sort of looked at all of the smallest municipalities in their database. And now there may be smaller ones out there, um, but this, you know, this is where I could search um, and, and find information. And so Syracuse, New York is one of the smallest um, municipalities in their database. Um, and Oops, sorry, I just lost my window here. Where did it go? Apologies. Um, and so here I gave you some a little bit of statistics about what Syracuse looks like as a as a community. 
um, to sort of compare with what we're talking about, right? Um, so, you know, Syracuse has a population of 143,000 ish compared to Arlington's maybe 40, I think we're 42 or 43,000 um, today. They have 375 sworn officers, which is about six times, I think, what we have. I think we're around 60, 65, um, I think has been over the years recently. Is that right, Chief Flaherty? We're budgeted for 68. Okay, great, yep. Um, and then, so th their board was established in 2011. Um, and the, their budget, I think, I think that's a 2018 number. I think all of these are 2018 numbers. Um, was 140,000 ish dollars, um, and most of that is again their staffing, right? Um, they their overall police budget is about 47 million dollars, um, and Chief Flaherty can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think our salary is a, approximately eight million. I think for the for the town is that is that about right? Correct. Yep. Um, so again, comparison. Um, their board has 11 members and two professional staff. Um, it, was, it was a little unclear in my reading. I think there is one full-time professional staff, and then they have another staff member that they either share or, um, it, it, again, it was unclear whether the second staff was actually full-time part of the um, part of the board. Um, in 2018, they received 83 complaints and held hearings on 15 of them. Um, and I went back. They 2018 is the last year that they have their public data posted for. Um, and so I don't know what may have happened in the last two years. Um, I did poke through, you know, a few years prior and saw roughly similar numbers for, for previous years, but I didn't pull them all or do any averaging or anything like that. Um, so 11 member board, they're appointed by a combination of the mayor, city councilors, and you know, in their documentation, right, they say that they expect board members to each spend about 10 hours per month, um, you know, averaged across the year, attending hearings and meetings and preparing for hearings, um, doing training and doing community outreach. Um, and so then, you know, in terms of what they can and can't do, um, they can hire and fire the, the CRB administrator. They accept and they investigate complaints. They hold hearings and they make findings on complaints and they make um, policy recommendations. Um, the CRB has access to dispatch records, use of force reports, stop search, stop search and arrest records. It has access to body worn camera footage. Um, it has access to professional standards investigations that are open um, as well as closed ones. Um, and then, oh, I didn't mention it here. I think it's on the next page. They also, um, when they go to a hearing, they may subpoena witnesses. Okay. Questions about sort of how we compare to Syracuse or or the, the basics here before. If you, you're probably about to get to this, but yeah. I just, I'm curious about sort of the process, like how they get from 83 complaints to 15. Yep. I, yep. That's where that's where, we, that's where we're going right next. Thank you for the segue. Um, so what happens? Oops, I'm missing a page. Oh, here we go. Sorry, I skipped a page. Uh, what happens to a complaint um, in Syracuse? Um, and so this is based on me reading their documentation of what's supposed to happen, right? I, 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 I'm not reading a report about, you know, we all know that the reality of what's written on What's written on paper versus reality is sometimes a little bit different. This is based on what's written on paper for them. Um, complaints can be received by CRB um, or their Office of Professional Standards. Um, CRB and OPS are required to immediately report to each other um, whenever they receive a complaint. Um, and then mediation is offered to the complainant both at the beginning and at several steps along the way that they can either choose to participate in um, or, or that will happen if they choose to participate or, or not happen if, if either party chooses not to participate. Um, and the complainant may withdraw their complaint at any time during the process at which, at which point it disappears. Um, like the, the CRB would stop taking action on it if the complainant um, withdrew it. Um, so after the complaint is received, 
the CRB administrator and OPS conduct their investigations in parallel, right? Some of those investigations may be very short, right? And, you know, this is unfounded. This is, um, you know, yeah, it may be very short. And, and some of those may be fairly involved. Um, OPS is required to provide their report and recommendation to the CRB administrator, right? And then the CRB administrator incorporates that information into um, their uh, recommendations, right? And and so they bring that recommendation to, um, excuse me, the full CRB, okay? And the CRB will decide whether to proceed to a hearing based on the reports and recommendations of the CRB administrator. So again, the professional staff person is taking, is receiving the complaint, is doing an investigation, right? That may be very in depth or not so much, right? Depending on, on what they find about the complaint. And then they bring their recommendation to um, the, the, the board. And the board then votes whether to um, hold a hearing on on that or whether um, to not hold a hearing okay so that's that's sort of how we get from the 83 to 15 and and I'm understanding so any complaint that that 83 by definition includes any complaint that goes straight through OPS even if so like to, to bring it back to Arlington Sure. Flaherty now has like a, you know, she she's explained to us sometimes someone might walk in the door. There's a variety of ways, but under that system, any of those complaints would get, there's no complaint that OPS gets that CRB doesn't at least. That is, that like, is, in, no that is how it is intended to work. Yes. Okay. That is the design of their okay. system. Any complaint that, that goes to OPS, right, or goes to the police department in any form, makes its way to CRB, and any complaint that goes to CRB makes its way to OPS as well. And does the complainant have, um, like, can the complainant, I mean, obviously the, the complainant couldn't stop OPS from doing an investigation, but could a complainant say like, I'd rather just see what happens with OPS, I don't really, I'm not interested in the CRB process yet. So the complainant can withdraw their complaint is my understanding, right? Is so, my understanding. so if they withdraw it, it's just from, okay. Yep. That's my, again, this is my understanding based on reading. Yep. Um, can, can I ask a question? Yeah, Hi, sure. Sorry. Uh, sorry, I, um, I was a little bit late uh, checking in. Um, I think this certainly sounds good. I've done some work in other places that have been on, um, have taken people's complaints and what have you. And what I'm wondering here is what the what the time frame is. Yeah. Um, and and that I think should be specified so that the person who has the is filing the complaint and folks who are responding have an idea as to. So we're actually going to talk about that in in just uh, in a little bit. Well, see, yep. okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because that is a that is a big a big issue. Um, yeah. Um, but there there are in their documents right in their um, charter right they have timelines for all of this stuff laid out. Oh, good. Um, is is the answer right that yeah. they Thank have you. timelines for that laid out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but we'll talk a little bit more about what comes after that. Um, yeah. So the the CRB that that's how we got from the eighty three to fifteen. Any other questions here? Okay. So what happens? So you know, many of these complaints don't go to a hearing, right? Nothing. You know, OPS and the chief can decide to do whatever they're going to do, and the the CRB does not weigh in on them, right? For those fifteen that we're having a hearing for what happens. Um, so the board members in Syracuse um, rotate, making up three member panels, right? So again, we remember we had 11 board members. They take turns um, dividing into three member panels um, for, for hearings. Um, officers and complainants um, at these hearings have a right to um, obtain counsel, right? Um, and they may cross-examine witnesses at these hearings. Right, so they are they are present for the hearings, and they and they may ask questions of witnesses. 
Um, hearings, though, are closed to the public, right? There is no public access to the hearing. Um, and then after the um, you know, witnesses and the presentation of the hearing itself, the panel goes into deliberation. And that is actually just the panel. So the, the complainant and the, um, you know, any um, department personnel who are involved in, in this are not present for um, the deliberation of, of the panel itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. The decisions, um, including findings and recommendations, are made by a majority vote of those three panel members. Right. And the panel essentially chooses whether to sustain the finding of the CRB administrator. Right. Um, if they choose to sustain it, right, then then or or they can choose to not um, it, as well. You know, if they sustain it, um, they may recommend restitution for the complainant. Now, they don't get to automatically award that or, or give a dollar amount. Right. Um, but they can recommend it. And the complainant can then take that up with the city, right? Um, the panel may recommend specific um, disciplinary sanctions for an officer, um, and you know there's a they have a whole list of of sanctions that they can um, that they can recommend that run the the full gamut, right? Um, if the chief of police does not accept their um, recommendation. The chief is required to respond in in writing, um, and this was actually a, a matter of some dispute in Syracuse um, for for a number of years. Um, but at this point, the chief does now do this. Um, and then I should note, in 2018, in their report, um, the CRB sustained eight of those 15 cases that they held hearings on. Okay. Um, and the chief followed the CRB recommendation in one of those eight sustained cases. Okay. Um, and I think that's, you know, that gets back to one of the um, uh, challenges in this model, right? Um, when when there's not alignment between you know what the board is recommending and what the uh you know municipal executive or the the chief is willing to do right there can be a, a loss of legitimacy for somebody involved in that situation um and that you know makes a very challenging situation um so the crb provides a summary of their sustained cases in their annual report um, and so I've provided the 2018 one there, and at the similar link, you can find, you know, a bunch of previous years if you wanted to go sort of read the kind of summary that they provide to the public. Because remember, the public has not participated in the hearing, right? They don't get any evidence um, for anything that's not sustained. There's there's no reporting other than that there a hearing was held. Um, for sustained ones, they do provide a public summary. Sorry, Kathy, did you have a, a question or? A uh, no, finish your thought, but I, maybe at the end, I, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, and so the, you know, you can go through and, and sort of read, it was very interesting to sort of read their summaries of where they had sustained um, and what they had recommended. Um, and I did not, they did not, that I saw post publicly the chief's responses. Um, they had, they, the chief provides them, but it, I don't believe we saw, I don't believe I saw them in their annual report. Um, so for Syracuse. Go ahead, Kathy. So Sanjay, in the course of your excellent research, this is really quite fascinating. Did the role of unions or labor contracts come up um, and whether that, you know, how, how does that work? For example, you know, the one out of eight is, is quite a, uh, low number, but I have to wonder whether union issues may have impacted that number. I, 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 Syracuse did not offer any sort of specific details on, on why they thought that the chief was not sustaining their findings or not implementing their sustained um, recommendations. Um, <laughs> I don't think you're wrong, though, right? I, I think that that, that right, whether it's directly through 
um, labor contracts, right? Whether it's in Massachusetts through, you know, civil service kinds of things, right? Uh, there's a whole lot of things that are outside the scope of that CRB, you know, that, it, you know, if they don't know what they can, you know, what the law is going to back them up and recommending, right? They can, they can run into problems for sure. Sanjay, yeah. can I offer some additional context on that? Absolutely. So um, there's a, sort of two buckets of issues. One is the counsel that they're talking about, people being entitled to counsel, are usually union lawyers. So usually a lawyer provided by the unions uh, for the defense. And that, that, that can similarly, that's not that different from the process that happens in an internal disciplinary matter with a unionized employee in the town. So if uh, professional standards, you know, reaches a finding and there's discipline involved, um, chief is more active in this than I am, but you know, there's usually a union uh, representative and oftentimes a union lawyer if there's, if the charges and consequences are significant or serious. The other piece I would say that you're getting at Kathy is that if you're going to have something like this, uh, it's probably going to have to be what's called impact bargained. So, or, 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 or even more, I'm sorry, even more than impact bargained, it has to likely be bargained. Um, and there's a potential that it would go to the Joint Labor Management Commission. So there's a front end to it. The back, that, that's probably where the unions are most involved is, you know, collectively bargaining to have something like this because you can't just sort of unilaterally impose a secondary or a parallel um, investigative and disciplinary process. The other point of tension that's quite common um, though is, is a mixture between management and labor issues that you guys are highlighting, which is um, typically under most forms of government, the chief and the mayor or um, in some forms of government in Massachusetts, it depends in our, in our form, it's the manager, um, are the ones that make decisions about um, terminations, things like that. So it's not necessarily just the unions, uh, it's part that, that that authority isn't typically given to, um, to uh, you know, a, any other body in any context other than the chief executive um, officer. Thank you. That's that's very helpful, Carlos. Sandy, by the way, thank you so much. I mean, this is this yeah. is fascinating. It's great, great job. Um, a question here I have in, in, in what you were saying about the statistics that the chief in the Syracuse case is in 2018. They say follow recommendation one out of eight, just, just to make sure that you know maybe. Uh, is there any sense that maybe the, the CRB recommended A and the chief did B, which is they didn't follow recommendations. So it's not that there were no actions on, yeah. on that because that, that's very low batting average. But I, but I suspect that many of these are like the chief had uh, you know, a different response than what is the, the CRB uh, you know, adjudicated. So, so I was thinking that maybe there's something that is that kind of thing is is very possible um and and i but i don't right again from what i have access to right this is this is the information data, right? that yeah <laughs> this is the information that they've provided and I, but i do think that that is a a very real possibility right of um you know the the crb recommended a and the the chief you know instituted a minus one or a plus or, one exactly or, or b or a plus one or b yeah. or yeah <laughs> exactly. I, I you know i can't i can't say for sure right again they didn't provide they didn't provide it would be nice if they had provided the chief's response right in in all of those cases and at least i didn't find it in in the searching that i did um Right, I no. mean, it could also be a matter of like uh, confidentiality, right? so. Possibly, yeah. possibly, yep. Um, so I have one more slide here. So um, most of what we've seen so far is from their official documentation, right? Um, there's a couple of other things that come from 
sort of more news reports and you know reporting about um, the this, the Syracuse CRB from externally, right? Um, so in twenty um, in July twenty twenty, there were reports about the Syracuse um, oh. Citizen Review Board um, that they had a significant backlog of cases. Um, now again, this is public reporting, so you know you don't know exactly what's going on here, but out 89 cases were outstanding in, in July 2020, dating back as far as 2017, okay? And um, 44 of those cases were outside of the window to impose discipline. So, and I, the again, from the reporting, there is a window, um, and I don't know whether the law is, is New York State or whether it's Syracuse particular or it's collective bargaining, but but basically the secure, Syracuse Police Department has 18 months from an incident to impose discipline. And after 18 months, the clock has run out and they cannot impose discipline for it. Um, and so right, the what this reporting was saying is that 44 of their cases had passed 18 months since the incident involved Right, and so even if the CRB made a finding, right, um, sustained a finding and recommended any sort of discipline, you know, there would not be it would not be possible for um, the the chief to impose it. Okay, so this is reporting as of last of last summer, year ago now, um, and then there was initial. Um, uh, movement there in this spring where the CRB administrator um, requested additional staff and additional funding for staff, right, from the Syracuse Council. Um, and specifically, she wanted to hire an, an investigator, two analysts, and a community engagement specialist. Um, and I think what ended up being proposed to the council was doing half of that um, at a cost of about $80,000. Um, and they de they declined to do that. And it's unclear whether it was bogged down in just the politics of where money has to come from and that sort of stuff, or whether they truly didn't want to do this. Or again, right? I'm reading news reports after the fact, not um, so. But they, in the end, they did not do that. And so the CRB in Syracuse uh, appears to exist in the same form that it has with the same backlog. And and I, you know, I think this comes back to sort of you know Kathy's question about resources. And that earlier, you know, in that strengths and weaknesses, right? If if you get behind, if you don't resource it properly, right, you can get behind. And when you get behind, you can lose public confidence. And if you lose public confidence, what are you here for, right? Um, so that you know, there's a there's a real risk, um, real risk there. Um, so anyway, that, that's the last slide that I have. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to say I'm speaking authoritatively about what happened, right, in terms of this backlog or the staffing requests or anything like that, right? But uh, I did think it was, you know, I found these news reports and I did think it was worthwhile to to bring them to your attention. So, Carlos has his hand raised. Oh, oh, sorry, that was from before. Oh, okay. But now that you call on me, I can say something. <laughs> <laughs> So Sanjay, thank you very much. I mean, this is this is fantastic. Uh, you you had mentioned in your email that uh, Nicole has a new report with new data. Yes. And I think that when I when I first did, did this, you know, not long ago, I only had access to the old report. Yes. So thank you for finding that because I think it's it it, it was it's important to have some newer data and and you know uh, and that's when you post, when we finally post all these documents uh, yes. in, in a place, it'll be great to go and, and check those out. Yes, I have the links for those two new documents here. Um, like I said, right, I had been looking earlier in the spring and had only seen their, I think it was 2016 yeah. reports. Um, and these are fresh new 2020, 20, or 2021 um, reports. Oh, so they're, fantastic. Thank you. they're Thank you. Um, really quite interesting reads. Yeah. So I have a question. I don't know if for you or for Doug or, or the chief. So say that, you know, this investigative model is, you know, very expensive uh, for a town or size and we don't have the caseload to support this type of, you know, uh, model. Uh, is it possible? And I don't know, uh, given the Massachusetts police reform bill, where they have, uh, you know, at state level, some investigative, you know, authority, 
is there, w would it be, you know, I, I don't know how it would work. And the question is, like, you know, can we piggyback out of that system where maybe there is a CRB in Arlington that says we don't have something to investigate, but we have some kind of claims. And we, you know, we basically ask the, the Massachusetts, you know, uh, police, you know, whatever authority to, to look into something because we don't have the ability. Will that, is, is that something that is even possible? I don't know, dog or? I think I, I could comment on that. Yeah. There, there is an investigative body. Um, so um, for police reform, I'm now required to submit any complaint to the state within two days of receiving it. Um, we're still waiting for guidance on where we're submitting that to. We don't, they don't have everything in play right now. I know they're in the process of hiring an executive director for post, and I expect that that will be pretty soon by September 1st, but um, we are required to submit those and there will be an investigative body investigating those complaints. Um, but I also wanted to comment on, um, I find it very interesting about the backlog because in my experience, we try to um, conclude any type of investigation within 30 days and sometimes it goes much longer and there's so many things that come into play and I'm thinking of our most recent investigation um, where we had um, a witness that was on vacation for two weeks and then that witness had to quarantine for two weeks so the investigator wasn't able to interview them and then we had um, private businesses who had video footage who had camera systems down and they had to wait to, for experts to come in and then um, we're making um, appointments for interviews with, with outside attorneys and it just can go on and on and weeks could literally go by before you can pin someone down. So I can see how investigations can really um, um, take a long time, but I, <laughs> having that many on backlog is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Carlos, if I can just add one other thing. I think one thing that might be important for everybody to keep in mind, no matter what the end model this body decides to recommend is there should probably be some element of what we're discussing that makes sure that people have, whether it's provided by a new entity or it's provided by existing entities, that they have a lot of information about the post because the post has the ability to receive complaints directly they don't have to go through uh, a police department or through some other local entity. If somebody has a complaint about the police, uh, they can file directly with post. Now, that being said, it's important to understand that they have discretion to investigate um, some complaints. They must investigate what they call serious complaints. We're still waiting for some information on what constitutes a serious complaint to the post, but I, I think we can imagine what some of them might be. Um, and it's also important to remember that there's like some other things that the post does or the, the reform bill uh, says need to be done that um, might also be important to have some sort of point of contact for conveying and making sure that people understand that information um, as well. Thank you. Okay, any other thoughts or questions before? I know I've taken up a big chunk of our time here tonight, um, but I, thank you folks. I think that was a really good discussion and thank you for your questions. Thank you for- um, Thank you. I, I think the case study was also just a really good way of looking at it. I'm just curious actually, when you said Syracuse is one of the smallest, what, what made you pick Syracuse other than it's so on the yeah so the, the sort of the, the two smallest um uh bodies with investigative models right a lot of the smaller ones did not have investigative models first of all right mm -hmm. um just looking at what was there and and the two that had them were Berkeley and Syracuse those were the sort of two smallest and Berkeley actually Berkeley California this that is um just totally redid their police oversight program um totally changed um the the body and the way it works and so i didn't want to wade into trying to figure out what was old information versus what was new information on, on a body that i think literally was passed into law like july 1st or something like that um and so i said okay let's 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 take syracuse yep great 
that's how I picked it. <laughs> no, um, I, and, was, I didn't know if you picked it because it was like East Coast or, you know, it was just. Yeah, that's, it, it's the smallest. And, and again, I would say, right, it's, it's actually, you know, it, it's not a very good analogy for Arlington. Right. right. It is the smallest, but it, it is not actually a very good analogy for Arlington, right? As we saw just in statistics. And also if you as if and you know, thinking about the kind of community that it is, right? It is a it's a you know, it's the largest community of its area of its area, right? Um it is, you know, yeah, a fairly diverse city, right? It's it's a um you know, it's a place where people from around come to Syracuse, right? Um, you know, a little bit different. You know, it, it's it's the ten thousand pound gorilla in its area, right? Right, right. And yeah. also, but I I think that, I mean, to me, the fact that it's so different is still super is very useful because, yeah. um, I think a huge you know, to see what the scale of a community three times our size is, I mean, you can sort of roughly guess we're not going to do, we can't do, if we wanted to do exactly what they do, which I'm not suggesting at all, because it doesn't, my, my feeling is that that doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me, at least from what we've learned. We, you know, even if you guessed, you know, a third of the cost, a third of the complaints, you know, you still need yeah. professional and, staff. And for me, it, I don't think we even necessarily have to have the cost conversation, right? We can we can have the conversation about what works for Arlington or what right. would what might work for Arlington, right? And then we can layer cost on, on top of that, right? right. Uh, so I think, yeah. Yeah. So um, anyway, th that's one investigative model. So I think we should probably I think we've got lots of other things to talk about too. So unless there's other questions, maybe we should move on. Carrie, was that a question or? No, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, thank you, Sanjay. You wanna yeah. un- I'll stop sharing. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the next thing on our agenda was we started talking last meeting we talked quite a bit about the challenges of outreach uh and gathering information unfortunately uh jill wasn't she was going to try to come into the end of the meeting she had a conflicting program uh so we don't have her to hear more about what she has done is thinking you know she gave us a lot of really good insight I think last time on how challenging this is um and Clarissa had uh taught had said she was gonna start with the faith community that was sort of like a place to start in terms of having a community meeting Clarissa couldn't be here tonight she sounded like in the email that she sent me she's thinking that this can't be done before September so I don't think she'd have um, any updates for us either. Uh, Susan, who is, for those of you who don't know or may have forgotten, is a, she is a communications professional. And so she has given us some thoughts initially about, you know, some part of how to get to go about beginning this. And I don't know if everybody got a chance to read her memo, but I'm gonna turn it over to her now. Thanks, Laura. Um, I'm, I'm sorry I missed the discussion at the last meeting. Laura described it to me and it sounds like it was very interesting. And um, obviously there are a lot of complications to trying to solicit community input. You wanna make sure you hear from everybody. So one um, idea that I had, and this isn't to replace the idea of holding one or two meetings to solicit input. It would, it would complement anything that we do. And that would be to ask those of us who are here, you know, as voting members or any member representing a group that we go back to the group that we're from. And in my case, that would be the Rainbow Commission and say, hey, the, the police committee, the police study committee is interested in hearing from us about what uh, we think 
the police committee should be thinking about as it deliberates on how to get more civilian involvement um, with police operations. Um, and by way of one, uh, one caveat would be that I know, and again, speaking for the Rainbow Commission, I know that no one on that commission would say that they speak for the LGBTQIA plus community in Arlington. That said, um, I think that the, again, speaking solely for the Rainbow Commission, it could offer insight into what members of the community um, feel about the police um, and what they might want us to consider. I, and I have no idea what they would offer as a potential solution. But um, we might gather some interesting information if we send all of us out to back to the groups that we represent um, and put it to our committees or commissions, what do you think the police committee should be considering? Um, and if it's helpful, I can give a you know, very concrete example. Um, if I went back to the Rainbow Commission and said, hey, this police committee that you've sent me to, um, they're very interested in knowing about uh, what the queer community in Arlington, um, what its concerns are around police. I am absolutely confident that the commission would probably say there are low levels of trust in the community with the police, not necessarily with Arlington police specifically, but for people um, who may live in Arlington, but work in Boston, if they're transgender or trans, trans feminine in particular, and what trans feminine is, um, would be uh, somebody who was assigned a male sex at birth, but now identifies as female. In Boston, in Lawrence, it is just a nightmare dealing with police. You can be walking down the street and you'll be questioned for being a prostitute. I just can't tell you how many people share that experience with me. And again, that's not necessarily happening in Arlington when you walk down Mass Ave, but if you work in Boston or you socialize in Boston or in Lawrence, those two communities are, are very problematic. Another thing they would share is that any gay man in their 60s or 70s has likely had incredibly negative interactions with police just because it used to be illegal to be gay. Um, and the third example would be people like me, you know, until 2015, when uh, the Obergefell decision was in the Supreme Court, my wife and I had to give very careful consideration to what documents, what legal documents we brought whenever we went on vacation and left Massachusetts. If we frequently go to Vermont, we drive through New Hampshire, we would always have to have a copy of our marriage license, healthcare proxy, power of attorney, just in case of an emergency. Um, so all of this leads to low levels of trust. I think the Rainbow Commission would share those things with us. I have no idea what the commission would say, what this committee might come up with to help with those issues, but we might get some interesting things if we go out to all of our people and mm -hmm. um, ask for ideas and feedback. So that's my idea. Sanjay. Um, Susan, were, did you sort of, um, did you envision sort of putting together a, a sort of, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to say maybe like a form letter um, that, that, you know, each person takes back to their, their committee, such sort of solicit a sort of, so that we're soliciting in a standard way? I, yeah, I think that's important. And we would have to agree on that. I provided an example in the memo, like just saying, based on your committee's knowledge of the community whose interests you represent, what information do you believe is important for yeah. the Civilian Police Advisory Board Study Committee to understand about the community that you represent? And do you have ideas? Yeah. Do you think we need to provide them any additional information to, to sort of um, help prompt that discussion. To contextualize it or? Yeah, yeah, right? Like we've done a whole lot of learning here. 
actually, I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this leads to another idea that's kind of related. And I think it's something that Kathy may have brought up in the last meeting, which is the idea of um, an interim report. Like we've um, had the opportunity right now to listen to your report, Sanjay, and Carlos and Kathy. Um, we should be sharing that with, with our committees and commissions, and that might help contextualize what we've learned. Um, and it, I mean, if we want to go crazy, we could even present before the select board, hey, this is what we've learned thus far and whatever we want to do. It's just a way of sharing out. Um, but that might help with the contextualization as well. I told, I told Susan in an email that I would be happy to take a laboring or on that um, and would seek help from another or two if, if you really wanted to do something comprehensive. But I, I'm willing to take that assignment on if that would be of assistance. Because I do think, Sanjay, you make an excellent point. We, it might be better to provide some context before we ask for input. Um, and if I may, Susan, on your, uh, I'm looking at page two of your memo at the bullet point. I'm wondering if um, you might be open to not only asking about the community whose interest you represent, but consistent with the mission of your organization. That is, you know, what is the historical mission and then what are the interests you represent? Um, and another question that I, I would be interested to hear answers from is what are your hopes? For our group, what are the re, you know what are what are you hoping? I mean, we we have expectations out there, and certainly we need to either meet them or or try to meet them. Um, but it would be I think it would be useful for us to understand what are the expectations of our town. That's a fantastic. I think that makes so much sense because you know though I feel like I'm just starting to be more out and about when I've when I've talked to people around town about it there's a pretty what there's some people know nothing about the fact that we exist or what we're doing um some people particularly if they're town meeting members know the origin of the of where we came from but there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of like gut responses and I think it is really important to share the information that we we have got. I mean, we're a study committee. Remember, that's what we're doing. You know, we're not. That's that's the origin of it, and to show that we are truly studying it and want to share share that knowledge with everybody. And it does seem like I had when Susan and I were talking about this. I mentioned what you you and Michael at the last meeting, you, Kathy, and Michael had talked about interest in sort of trying to like have a concrete like summary of what, you know, what we have learned so far. So that's where I thought this had, this had overlap. Yeah, I, I mean, I see what Kathleen now saying that the, the same thing that we we're talking with Michael last time, right? It's, it's this summary of what we've known so far. Can, can we just get a summary? It's like, okay, now that we all have explored all these different pieces, right? So dog, Saint Jay, and you know, and, and that we, uh, two things, right? I, I see coming up here. One of them is more like a summary document so we can just like, you know, can we read in one place the summary of all the different pieces, right? So organ organize the information. But another one, which is very critical, I think is what Susan is talking about. I mean, uh, the potential here is the idea, can we have like a pamphlet, like a one page of what we are and what we kind of know so far and, and, we, and what we're trying to ask people, right? And it, 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 it's a different thing, right? One of them is it's more like the summary of all the information that we have so we can quickly you know, see what we have and somebody who wants deeper questions can answer that. But the other one is like, what is the elevator pitch? So if I run to somebody at Starbucks, they're like, like this is what we're trying to do. What, tell me something about it. Or, or when we go back to, to, to the community, we need to say, this is what we're trying, the question that we have, what, what is it that you want us to look at? 
I mean, I went back to, to the diversity task um, force and, and I, I, I only told my part of the story, right? But I wish that we can just go around and along with that, be able to have a summary, you know, what Doug has said, what Sanjay, you know, did today and all these other pieces, which I think uh, that, you know, and in succinct way, right? Something that, that is succinct, you know, a, a summary. But I see two different documents in here. And I don't know, uh, uh, Kathleen and Michael, I don't know if you, if you want to tackle either one of the two, well, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be happy to join you, you know, with you in doing that. And I don't know who's more like uh, marketing oriented to do the, <laughs> the elevator pitch piece, right? I mean, right. I, I'll be glad also to, I mean, we'll-, we'll I feel, also... right. I feel more comfortable on the summarizing the facts than the marketing piece. Although I absolutely uh, agree with you, Carlos, that it may be that, you know, we, we have two different goals and we may need two different documents. Elliot. Um, I think especially for the high school, like it's probably important to kind of combine the two. Cause if like, if I go back in the fall and I like send out a list of like, or a document of what we've done and what we studied, probably nobody's going to care, or even look at it. But if we yeah. send out a list, like, here's what we've done and here's what we need your help with, I think that would probably get, like, a lot more interaction response. Elliot, you've just summed it up in one sentence. And this is why we love the young people. Yeah. Here's what we've done, and this is what we need from you. Or just the great communicators, regardless <laughs> of age. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> no, I think... That makes so much sense. And I think of them as, I think I can sort of see them as companion documents. You know, they both go up on the website. We, you know, we try to distribute the, both, both of them to as, as, you know, all of the bodies that we represent, but then that sort of one or two pager, we, you know, like this, when, when we talked last meeting about like the attempt to like get information to all of these different places to the you know to monotony manor to the council on age to places people that aren't necessarily going to talk to the rainbow commission directly or that you know wh whichever groups we're talking about um like to have these a pamphlet type thing available would be really could be incredibly useful and if they're done in digital format, they can be used as ingredients and moved around in different right. pieces. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's not static. If Elliot needs something and he's right, he's gonna to try to do it in 144 characters or you know, no one's gonna read beyond that, then he can take what he needs from the documents that, uh, that may be written by two or three of us and, 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 and you know, he, ha he can have that freedom. What speaks to his constituency best and most effectively? Doug, I see you have your hand raised. I just wanted to add that I think a couple of you at different times have articulated something that would be useful in both of these contexts, a sort of information document and an information seeking document. And that's the idea of what are the gaps. So we've talked a lot about post and what that is. We've talked a little bit about what professional standards internally in APD does. And we've talked a lot about what are some different models for providing additional oversight. Um, and so the question, I'm sorry, the information is, okay, here's what the state is gonna be doing now. Here's what APD does now. Here's what some of the models for review are, um, that's kind of part of what we've done. And then the sort of question that we're, that I think Susan is, is rightly provided a sort of pathway towards is, well, what are the perceived gaps? I, I'm sorry, I'm stealing this from somebody. I can't remember if it was Carlos or if it was you, Laura, or who it was from, but what are the perceived gaps um, within different constituencies in Arlington that help us identify what are the things that we really want to solve understanding that these are the pieces that are in place now and this is the community that we're in i mean the, I, i'm always 
I'm always optimistic that concise presentations can be made, but then I'm one of those people that starts thinking about, well, it's also really important to say that this is in the context of the town form of government. And town meeting does have a lot of ability to raise, but, but I, I, I think there are better people, uh, there, there are people who are very good communicators here that are equipped to sort of get what the, but I really like the way that a lot of you folks have talked about it in terms of what are the gaps? What are the gaps that people see that they want to sort of understand better? And, and what are the pieces that are gonna be in place regardless of what uh, the committee does? So obviously the title of our interim report is Mind the Gap. <laughs> Thank God somebody laughed. Um, but uh, what would next steps be for moving these ideas forward? Um, it sounded to me like um, Kathy was, was perhaps volunteering to, to lead the charge. Um, I would be very willing to contribute if, if my services could be helpful. Um, nope, you're, you're muted. You provided excellent content already, Sanjay. That's great. But I do, I mean, I'd, I'd like to be able to, even though I'm offering to take the laboring or I need a thought partner or two, you know, to figure out what do we want to cover? Um, I don't want to, you know, I'm hearing a lot about being concise, but boy, our work is going to be hard to make concise given what we've done. What and I think, I think we can have an executive summary and a, and a longer, yeah. right? I like that idea. Exactly. Yeah. Good. I mean, I think, I, I think like, yes, we want to have, you know, something that is useful, you know, useful to Elliot, useful to all of us that is, you know, I think like there's the executive summary, there's the pamphlet, but like, I think, I don't think we should worry too much about how concise we are with what's at the back of all of it, because that's what, that's what we were asked to do is to study what's out there and, you know, we can't force people to read it, but if we've done it, it should be, I think we should document it and it should be available. Yep. Yeah, I, I would definitely start from um, what Kathy said, cover everything. And then in communications, you, if you have a really solid product that's comprehensive, you can carve it up and share it in many, many different ways. Um, I was going to ask Elliot, I, I don't want to draft you, Elliot, but I wanted to ask if you would be involved in this process as well. I think you'll offer a really important point of view if you have time. I would be happy to. Um, I'm going to be away for the next three weeks, so I don't know if Mona's around then, but apart from that, yeah. Thank you. And I'll just say the two names that had been said last time around, right, were, were Carlos and Michael. I don't know, you know, where, where, uh, Kathy, I don't know how many, People. right, how many cooks you want in the kitchen. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to say those names since mm -hmm. they were out there last time too, right? I, I'd, I'd welcome it. I don't, I, I need, I would like some help in at least getting what is the, you know, what is the outline? Because you know, from an, a good outline, you can start to write meaty things. But mm -hmm. without without an effective outline, you're sort of wandering the woods um, and stuff. So if uh, Michael and Carlos, if if you if you can, um, if we can be the team of chefs for an yeah, outline, I would appreciate be a chef with you. Thank you. Great. So do we need to like? I mean, we, we can just, do we need to take a vote on doing this now, right? I think we should vote to receive it after they've, we, after they've completed it. Okay. Is that, unless other people have a, that makes sense. have thoughts about that? Do, do, do we have a timeline? Just out of curiosity, I just sort of, um, I'm just trying to think about my summer and yep. what, you know, what, what's our process about, you know, sort of backwards design. I think next week we would be a, the right time. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, and, and thank no. you, Sunday. Uh, you, you're all. I, I appreciate your wisdom <laughs> at, at all moments. 
Um, but and, and uh, the levity is wonderful. It's just sort of thinking as we're trying to bring more momentum to the work. Well, what do we imagine in our mind's eye? You know, when do we imagine wanting to share this with people, given the requirements that you know that were set up by by this? You know, do we need? I, so, so I, Doug is a great person. That's who I meant to ask Doug, but I, go ahead. When's our next meeting? That's an excellent question, um, and that I need. Let me pull. I, well, I won't derail us right here, but um, I that have in the like poll. You had it something to say about what Michael was saying, Doug? I, you raising a hand? Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Did somebody else have a point they wanted to raise first? Oh, go ahead, Doug. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I mean, just as as a as a heads up, like most committees and commissions are pretty inactive in August, and, and that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It gives this uh, group time that they need. But for example, the, the next select board meeting is August 9th. And it just seems unrealistic to expect that you guys are gonna be able to pull something together, meet with this body. Um, and so the next meeting, I don't think for them, and not, not that they're necessarily the chief body that you need to hear from. It's pretty clear that you actually need to hear more from the bodies that you guys represent. But my guess is that most of your respective public bodies maybe have one meeting in August, maybe, and then more likely than not are really back in swing in September. So um, I know that we've got not a lot of time between September and the timeline you guys had pre previously etched out, but this is a pretty concrete and important step. And I, I, I for one, would suggest, or, or my, I guess my personal take is, better to have a document that you guys feel really good about in September than to be rushing to get something out in October so that you can try to get the focused feedback that Susan is sort of talking about from these constituent representing organizations. Is that perfect? We all know that. And I don't think Susan was suggesting that we can't do anything else in the interim, but th this might be some of the most concrete and constituent focused feedback that we get. So my, my take is, is, is a September date. That's, I mean, that's what I was thinking. I mean, we've said, you know, in various other contexts that we, we can't really expect to have a lot of, you know, a swell of public input before September. So if we took the next six weeks to create this document that is a real like foundation for helping us get that input I think that would be worthwhile. Yeah, and I, I don't think um, other people might disagree. I'm curious to hear what you think about this. I don't necessarily think we have to have this document done before we go back. Like I would be entirely, based on the updates I've been giving to the Rainbow Commission all along, it'd be a pretty easy conversation for me to have with them about, um, you know, what do you think we need, the, the police committee needs to know and what are you hoping to see from the police committee? Um, so I don't think we're necessarily have to be sequential. The interim report has to be done, then we ask people for feedback. So, but I, I do agree that the interim report should be, you know, take the time. And I would ask Kathy how much time she thinks she needs. So. You're muted. I need a few weeks. I'm, I'm not going on vacation in, in August. I've, I've been, so I am, I am around and I just need to dig, but you know, I, Carlos has put in, you know, Sanjay put in, for example, that, uh, you know, there could be a meeting on August 24th. I mean, I could certainly have a draft then, and I would have shown the draft or, or worked with the outline and shown the draft to Michael and Carlos first, and then be ready to present something August 24th. How would that work? That would be wonderful. But I mean, I couldn't do your first date, Sanjay, wouldn't work. I mean, you know. Yeah, the third wouldn't work. I mean, that's just, that's just, I'm trying to work within the confines of a meeting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I think August 24th would be wonderful. Yes. Yeah, I do too. That would give me four weeks. Right. So, so uh, you know, I, with Carlos and, and Michael, I could see them being the most help for me at the beginning and the end. That is the beginning as we try to figure out what should I be writing about. And then, you know, the second week in August or so to be able to give them my product and say, you know, rip it apart, improve it and stuff. And then we'll still be in draft form where there's plenty of time for the rest of you. This isn't a product of one or two or three people. It's the product of, of this. But, you know, somebody has to take the laboring ore. The first draft is usually the hardest. Right. So quick question for Doug Sanjay. How many people is quorum for us? Seven of the voting members, I believe. So there are, if there are at least less than seven people working together and some subcommittee doing like that, we're okay, right? As long as you're underneath the quorum of voting members. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So, so we can have a group of four people doing the most work and what we're going to be fine. So four or five people will be fine. Okay. Yeah, and I just want to know, it's not really like somebody's creating a subcommittee, which is a whole other animal. The whole thing. This, this <laughs> you guys just are just like working together, together. Yeah. put together, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And Susan, I think you were suggesting that, that, the, that maybe the other piece of it could be developed in parallel. So it doesn't have to be all, 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 all you know, on Kathy and right. Carlos and and uh, Michael, you know, while the sort of report pieces to be developed, right? Correct. That sounds good. Elliot, when will you be back from vacation? Uh, the 13th. Oh, you're right in time to read it before the, the, um, the committee. So you've got homework. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy, because I think you're right that the first draft is the hardest. And I also think like this is a, I mean, ultimately, I just think it's a huge amount of the work that we'll need to get done for town meeting next spring. And so like, I think it's great to, for us to put it in a format that we get use out of it, like public use out of it before then. But it's also really getting the ball rolling on what we have to do for our ultimate product as well. <clears throat> okay. So if we should, have we agreed that August 24th is our next meeting? Unless we think we need one on October, August 3rd for other topics. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, what do people? Maybe we could do a check-in on the 24th, see how it's going. And then uh, if more times the needed. Hmm? On the third, you mean? On the 24th, August well, we 24th. Decided we're gonna meet on the 24th. So the question is, do we meet once okay. before the 24th as well? Uh, why don't we leave that for after this, right? And why don't, you know, you and Susan and I sort yeah. of take a peek and see whether we have any agenda mm -hmm. items that need to be covered. Yeah. Okay. And we can propose via email um, the end of this week if we think yeah. that we would might need the August 3rd date as well. Does that sound reasonable to folks? That works. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. I feel like this was, Michael, did you, I can't, sometimes when people move their hands, I can't tell if they're like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just think Kathy, Carlos, I need to find a time soon to yep. meet, and I guess we have email them to do that. Yeah. Or we have we have each other's emails. Yeah. We do it. You have yeah. you have email uh, from yeah. me today. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I, I do have it. Yeah. Perfect. And did did were you raising your hand, Susan, or were you just Sanjay? Okay. Spoke for me. So. <laughs> Great. Um. Does somebody want to make a motion to adjourn if we don't have anything else tonight? Michael, I just put my email in there if you want. Right. Pretty simple. I'll put mine in. So moved. Second. Uh, Carlos. Hi. Carrie. Yes. Kathy. Yes. Sanjay? Yes. Michael? 
Yes. Bob. Um, oh, th I'm sorry. That reminds me. Bob has been doing some other information gathering that he, that may be something to put on the, if we're going to have an August 3rd meeting, maybe we can, I can check in with you, Bob, about you wanted, you had some research you wanted to present about other, you've been looking at the other nearby communities. You're muted. Yeah, I, I simply have to kind of reorganize it and put okay. it in a form. That I'll check in with you about that then. And okay. what I'll probably do is, if you think you're going to have a meeting beforehand, the third, possibly, I'll email that to you. And if you could attach it to whatever, something else to distribute it. Yeah, I will check in with you at the end of the week after we talk about whether that meeting makes sense. Okay. Uh, Susan. Yes. Uh, Elliot. Yes. Anne. Yes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night, Thank everyone. You. Good night, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. folks. Thanks.